Good afternoon. Uh, this is Rich Reynolds here. I look after the agriculture team with Anglian Water. Uh, very pleased to be chairing today. Uh, we've got two great speakers and we're looking at uh, um, farm business, farm business management and, and, and taking it forward. So uh, it's a really important part of, of any farm business is the planning, is the strategy. Um, and I think with the, the changes, the diversity, the challenges that are coming through in the next couple of years is going to become increasingly important. So really interested to, to hear what Henry and Sonia have to say. Uh, looking forward to it. Uh, Tim. Great. Thank you, Rich. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, great to be here with you. Um, so my name is Tim Hopkin. I'm, I'm founder of the Land App and Land Management 2.0. So everything we're doing is about trying to support the transition of the land sector to more regenerative practice um, and kind of ideally supporting people towards delivering triple bottom line outcomes. So it's a real pleasure to be with you here today and yet yeah, really looking forward to the presentations. Um, without any further ado, I think we will get going. So first up, we have Henry Barringer, who is a uh, food and farming consultant at Savills. So Henry, I will let you share your screen and start your presentation. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I just uh, first of all I'd like to say thank you to Anglian Water and Land Management 2.0 for inviting me to talk today. So I've been asked to discuss how land managers can build profitable business plans, which fully accounts for nature and environmental funding. Uh, there is increasing political urgency around uh, the effects of climate change, biodiversity loss and the introduction of new rural land legislation. This has placed new pressures on land managers to understand, monitor, and importantly, communicate the environmental and social value of their rural assets. It is important to understand how these assets can meet key environmental criteria and how they can also fin financially benefit the farm landscape. So what we know now is that BPS will be reducing from this year onwards and will be gone by 2028. And here's a copy of our BPS reduction calculator. In this example, I'm using a 600 acre farming business. We know that in 2020, they would have received circa 56,000 pounds of funding in direct payments from BPS. 2020 being the last full year payment or full payments of BPS as we know it. We know that in 2021, this will reduce to 51K. Okay, that doesn't sound too bad, right? Uh, well, by 2024, this is gonna be 26,000. And as you can see, it's gone by 2028. We see the biggest challenge going forwards is how farming businesses uh, continue to thrive, grow and maintain profitability during the agricultural transition period and the years after BPS is phased out. After all, BPS makes up a substantial part of the profit margin of many of our farming operations. As highlighted above, there are some sectors that are serious risk with BPS reduction. So from all of the excellent previous talks in this series, I don't think anyone is in doubt that environment will be the next big source of farm income. Whether or not this makes up for BPS loss is still unknown, but looks ever doubtful. It's obvious that rural landowners play a pivotal role in the shaping of the countryside. The positive socio-economic and environmental impact of well-managed rural land is substantial, whilst providing strong financial returns to those involved in stewardship. But unfortunately, there is a constant barrage of new environmental terms in the industry, and it's difficult for many to gauge which scheme they should be looking at first. For example, countryside stewardship is open for business, and we at Savills have seen the biggest uptake this year in higher tier and mid tier schemes since CS started in 2015. These schemes are offering good payment rates with guaranteed income and an early break clause for ELMS as and when it comes along. You can see why many are seeing these as attractive options over the transition period. CS will remain open to new applicants until 2023, with a final round of agreements in January 24. The other um, things listed above are in the pipeline with more and more information being released. Some of the private funding sources look exceptionally exciting for promoting environmental payments going forwards. But I would say for all of the above to be considered in a business plan, we recommend taking a few steps back first. First and foremost, we would recommend recording what you have on site now. Five minutes searching on Magic Map will let you know all of your priority habitats, key species, main water protection requirements and risks, just to name a few. 
We suggest you also make the most of free wildlife surveys from uh, keen amateurs. They are honestly out there and would be delighted to survey your farm. In essence, get as much baseline data now as you can. This will aid in assessing where you can target key options going forwards. And we believe make the transition into ELMS or other private funding schemes much, much easier. And I know it sounds obvious, but record these. Financial performance alone is no longer the key de detriment uh, determinant of business sustainability. Comparative performance assessment of all asset types is key to ensuring effective long-term management decisions are made. By knowing what you have now, you will be in the strongest possible position to take advantage of environmental funding as it becomes available. It may seem daunting to some, but these reports and baseline assessments are exceptionally useful tools. The Land App, for example, offers a very accessible way of recording these priority features and gives a table of summary of the areas you have on your estate or farm. We have used the Land App to support current countryside stewardship applications and also natural capital audits. If it's not something you feel comfortable completing, Savills have a wonderful service and reporting system. A natural capital performance review is a process that identifies, records, and quantifies the environmental, economic and social assets of rural land at any moment in time. This enables landowners and managers to monitor the performance of the natural capital that they manage and enables them to communicate this information to a wider audience. And I promise there's that's, that's the shameless plugs for land apps, uh, or land app and Savills Complete, I promise. So what levels of gross margin are you happy with? Where do, you where do you break even and make profit? Two key questions that only a few can answer straight away. We think that it is exceptionally important going forwards to set a gross margin target for every acre of productive land on your holding. It is equally important to understand financially where you are now with your current cropping and associated costs. Be that directly managed by yourself or through a joint CFA or joint venture or CFA. Let's also consider what is setting a benchmark in the market right now. Countryside Stewardship, for example, offers options like AB9, SW3 and AB15 to name a few. As you will see, they have different payment rates, but all offer an annual gross margin of around £200 per acre or plus. So does this mean that any land on the farm not producing an average of £200 per acre goes straight into Countryside Stewardship? Well, some of my clients have thought just that. We've looked at budget and actual figures. We've looked at yield and gross margin maps and data from our agronomy providers over a number of years and multiple crops. And we've taken a decision that any land not producing more than 200 pounds per acre gross margin is going into AB9, AB15, SW3 or AB8 under countryside stewardship. After all, why are we still growing crops that will make a loss? Utilising environmental funding to take out marginal land and at the same time increase in-field operational efficiency has to be seen as a positive all round. And technology is now there to aid us in our decision making process. This in turn has huge environmental benefits with biodiversity and watercourse protection being two key drivers other than finance. We feel it's also important to benchmark your current costs against local trends and industry standards. Industry averages are widely available for most variable and fixed costs. It's a perfect start for looking at where your costs might be high and running out of control, or alternatively, will tell you where you have good control of costs. Escalating costs are one of the most common reasons we see for loss making businesses. By gaining control of costs alongside restructuring farming operations, we're seeing farms get to the position of being profitable before adding BPS into their current cash position. Examples of restructuring would be machinery sharing agreements, contract farming agreements, or even employing other contractors on an operation by operation basis. Cash flows uh, really are a very useful tool. Play about with some figures and budgets, draft a maximised countryside stewardship scheme, and then have a look at how these will affect your cash flow over the next two or three, even four or five years. Again, we can offer assistance with some basic Excel cash flows that will show you where your pinch points are likely to come in any year. But it also may show you where you can afford to spend a bit more to generate more money or diversify your incomes. 
A final thought, if I may, have you, have you considered collaboration? Farmers have a reputation, and I say here in the most part, for being fairly isolated. But let's face it, we're all in the same boat and probably all worried about reducing, or reducing incomes and ever increasing costs. And how, of course, are we going to afford that very good looking new class Lexium? Opening a dialogue now with neighbours or other local farmers, creating a cluster or starting a joint venture could be exactly what helps a number of businesses out. Collaboration, we believe, is going to become more and more important. Not only machinery sharing to keep costs down, but the higher tier of elms and other environmental funding will need to see joined up landscape scale approaches to future management. So I'll leave you with three thoughts and next steps as listed here. Step one, understand your environmental features now. Step two, explore environmental funding that's currently available. And step three, understand your current financial position and set a gross margin cutoff. And there's my contact details by all means, please do get in touch with any queries. Great, thank you, Henry. Yeah, really informative just to see kind of exactly what people should be looking at and kind of where the opportunities are going forward. Clearly, Countryside Stewardship is offering a huge amount. So yeah, thank you very much for going through all of that. So next up, we have Saya Harvey. So Saya is the training manager at the Allerton Project. So Saya, I'll let you share your screen, start your presentation. Great, thanks, Tim. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to tell you a bit about what we're doing at the Allerton Project. Um, my role as training manager involves working closely with, with the research team um, and the farm team and kind of extracting all the learnings from, from the demonstration uh, projects and the research projects and distilling it into our training programme. And we run uh, the basis beta conservation course uh, as well as a number of other bespoke training sessions um, and farm walks for farmers, agronomists, policymakers, uh, agrochemical companies, um, and so on. Um, my background is um, quite varied, actually. I, I, I have a farming background and I manage our family arable farm, which is just down the road from Loddington. Um, but I also have a research background and practical habitat management um, and, and delivery of en environmental advice as well. So I, I kind of look at farming from lots of different angles. So um, the Allerton Trust, uh, Allerton Project, it, it lives in a small village uh, called Loddington, which is um, on the east, sort of in the east of Leicestershire, close to the Rutland border. The soil type is, is generally uh, high clay content, uh, quite heavy soil and quite undulating terrain with some, some quite seriously sloping land, but, but it is uh, definitely a very beautiful spot. So what are our uh, vital statistics? Oops, sorry, skipped on the side. Um, the farm is 320 hectares in size. Uh, 32 hectares of woodland, 30 hectares of permanent grassland, uh, five hectares of that is, is actually species rich, really nice species rich grassland. Um, so 258 hectares of, of land is, is arable, which is farmed within the arable rotation. But we have a very comprehensive um, countryside stewardship scheme um, on the farm. So uh, within that, five hectares of tusky grass margins and strips protecting watercourses and and uh, sort of high risk areas, um, 12 and a half hectares of flower rich and pollen and nectar habitat, 10 hectares of, of wild bird seed mix and 30 hectares of, of herbal lay or legume fallow. Um, but all of those habitats very much pay for themselves. They, we have the countryside stewardship scheme payment, but they also provide another function within, within the farm business. Um, and that's really what I, what I want to sort of highlight today. You know, use your countryside stewardship to, to, to work for you. Um, just to, to, to mention the, the farm there and the rotation, um, this is the, uh, the crops from last year. So it was very spring 
uh, crop heavy as we had a, a terrible winter and didn't get much winter uh, cropping in there, but we have a very diverse rotation um, as well, which is, is sort of part of the um, bringing biodiversity to the farm. Um, so research at the Allerton Trust, there's a huge amount going on at the Allerton Trust. And I was just thinking, what, what can I share with you that might be of interest? Uh, so I decided to pick three of the most relevant sort of bits of collaborative research um, that we're, we're doing. Um, and um, so I'm going to talk about uh, reduced tillage and what, what's enough, how far do you have to go to achieve the benefits? Uh, I want to talk about IPM and, and, you know, is it really possible to farm natural enemies? Um, and uh, uh, lastly, about soil protection, because um, let's face it, you want your soil in the field uh, because that's the only place that it's any use to you. And really, I want to set that within the context of, of countryside stewardship or, or environmental stewardship, of course, going forward. Um, because that really is the glue that brings all of these components together and, and makes it work for us at Loddington. So on that note, I've uh, interestingly showing you my, our little um, BPS calculator, uh, like, um, like Henry's. Um, and what, what I really wanted to show you was that we've, we've just actually come out of a higher tier scheme last year and renegotiated a new countryside stewardship mid-tier scheme. And you can see uh, in 2021, this year, our income from environmental stewardship has, has nearly doubled. Um, and we've achieved that really through introducing in-field options. So cover crops, herbal lays, legume fallow, low input cereal. And we're using those options to help us with blackgrass control, to help us with IPM, and, and also to help us with joint ventures, money-making ventures. So for example, the herbal lays are being grazed and, and the cover crops actually being grazed by our neighboring farmer, who's a sheep farmer, and he has his own butcher, butchery on, on the farm and sells all of his meat locally uh, uh, and very good it is too. So great collaborative opportunity as well. So the first uh, 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 sort of trial I want to tell you about is some work that we're doing with Syngenta, um, comparing different tillage systems. And um, we, we're looking at the, the full conventional plow system compared with a sort of min-till system, which is essentially uh, a low disturbance uh, subsoiler with a direct drill and then the light till option uh, which is in some years complete direct drill so, so zero tillage um, but if the soil surface is, is very hostile then possibly a light disking as well. Um, we're measuring lots of different things within the system um, there's it's, it's a whole farm scale uh, sort of um, experiment with five fields involved in the work. So we're looking at organic matter in the soils, yield, gross margin, fossil fuel consumption, etc. And I think a lot of these variables are really well understood. Um, and the benefits of, of reducing tillage is also, you know, sort of quite well understood in terms of fossil fuel reduction, increased soil organic matter and reduced um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, th some of the problems are also well understood as well, I, I don't deny that. Um, but And this work has demonstrated uh, very similar results to the perceived wisdom. But I think there's a few interesting trends that I just wanted to, to share with you. So if we look at the earthworm numbers, with the graph on the, the left hand side, earthworms are great flag flagship species for indicating soil health. Um, and it's generally accepted that with reduced tillage, you get more earthworms. But what we found actually is that the middle ground is best for earthworms. So throwing in that subsoil cultivation and bringing a bit of air into the soil profile is, is actually really good for earthworms. So, um, and you can see that quite clearly, the orange mintil um, treatment there has got um, higher earthworm numbers in both year one and year two. The differences between the years is to do with um, 
dryness. So they, the, the samples were taken in a very dry year in 2018 in, in year two. Uh, so luckily the low disturbance subsoil option, the sort of mint hill option actually doesn't seem to impact on greenhouse gas emissions either. Uh, so is, is you know, really good from that point of view. The carbon dioxide uh, emissions are similar and nitrous oxide uh, very similar. Where, where we really start to see a problem with nitrous oxide particularly is where the ground is very, very compacted. So these are some data from, not, nothing to do with Syngenta, um, but a, a compaction trial that we've been running where our poor farm manager has to have um, counselling afterwards because he, he drives a, a big tractor around in very muddy conditions causing compaction, um, uh, which then the, our research team ha have been investigating. Um, but you can see actually that in those compacted conditions with a direct drill uh, and no, no form of cultivation, um, nitrous oxide uh, release is, is very, very much higher. So you really do need to avoid co very compacted soils, which of course I'm sure all farmers are trying to avoid anyway. Uh, the good news is that the low disturbance subsoiler is also very good for worms as well, and it makes them happy. So moving on to uh, my next area of, of research, I wanted to talk about uh, pest natural enemies. Um, and reduced tillage, of course, is, is really good for uh, natural enemies. And there's over 1.5 million predators uh, in, in the form of ground um, active predators, beetles, centipedes, rove beetles, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, the less disturbance there is, the better it is for these beasties. Um, whoops. Um, and they tend to be generalist predators um, and they'll munch up aphids that have fallen off, off the crop, um, pest eggs and larvae um, and things that overwinter in the soil, slugs and things like that as well. So really, really good um, generalist predator. Uh, our crop active predators are more species specific uh, and they tend to hang out in field boundaries, which is why field boundaries can be so important. Um, and it's amazing how nature works, really. There are, there are species that are specific to all of the major pests of our crops in, in the UK. The trouble is we just don't really give them an opportunity to, to do their thing because of the use of, of insecticide. So these data are um, quite old, actually, but just show the impact of an insecticide application on uh, the four controlling aphids on the carabid beetle population. And you can see five days pre-spray, there's good numbers of carabid beetles. Um, and then um, uh, five days after the spray, absolutely nothing at all. And it takes 32 days to build back up. Um, and carabid beetles are reasonably, reasonably easy to come by, but parasitic wasps, take much, much longer to recolonize. So really think about how much you need that spray application before you do put it on. So uh, predicted levels of, of natural pest control across the UK. This is a, a map that our um, uh, farm uh, ecology team have been involved with developing. Um, and you can see that actually levels of predicted natural pest control are very low around the East Midlands, um, East Anglia and, and Midlands. Um, and this is, oh, I'm so sorry, I don't know why my slides are jumping forward. Um, but of course, we as farmers can actually, we can influence this and we can change it through the use of countryside stewardship or other agri-environment schemes sort of going forward. Um, the farmers ecology team have, have done some work and they've come up with uh, this SAFE acronym for what is really, really important for natural enemies. So shelter, somewhere to overwinter, somewhere to breed, somewhere to hang out when it's hot. Alternative prey, very important. Uh, pests are inevitably not there for a very long period of time. Uh, so you need something else for them to eat. 
Um, floral resources, very important and often the adult within a life cycle needs um, pollen and nectar for food. And, and then lastly, the environment uh, is important. Um, and, you know, they need uh, somewhere to do various different uh, parts of their life cycle. Um, and the way to achieve that is through different types of habitat, uh, different vegetation structure. Um, and of course, I'm going to say it again, these are the sorts of habitats, uh, the safe habitats around the farm for, um, for natural enemies. And they are, of course, all of the things that you can include within a countryside stewardship scheme. Um, if you want inform more information about that, there's a, there's a really good um, uh, information leaflet called Beneficials on Farmland Identification and, and Management Guidelines. So lastly, just to talk a little bit about uh, sort of location of habitat, and there's lots and lots of different factors that influence where you would put things. But if you're particularly thinking about IPM, then uh, headland aphid traps are something that, that we're looking at and trialling at, at Loddington. Um, we've done quite a lot of work to see how aphids are introduced into fields and they're generally blown in the wind and are deposited on the lee side of a, of a hedge uh, in, in sort of um, against the prevailing wind. Um, and three and a half times as many aphids will go into a 10 to 12 meter band on the lee side of a hedge compared with the rest of the field. Now, if you put a strip in there that's a, a flower rich or, or even a, a wild bird seed strip, then natural predators are going to gobble up those aphids before they get into the crop. And this could really, really help you with your uh, IPM um, policy on the farm. So, um, yeah, moving on to the, to the next uh, uh, thing that, the next experiment and work that we've been doing. Um, we've been working on quite a large scale um, uh, catchment scale um, project with the Freshwater Habitats Trust, uh, University of York, um, and of course all of the farmers within, within the different catchments. So we've taken three uh, cat water catchments um, and been in a very fortunate position to be funded. So all of the uh, water um, sedimentation, soil going into the water, pesticides going into the water, etc., cetera, um, has been monitored for a baseline before any interventions have, have been implemented. Um, and, and then within two of the catchments, some um, actual practical interventions have, have been implemented. So um, in field cover crops and uh, reduced tillage. And then when you get to the edge of the field, uh, uh, grass buffers along watercourses, uh, and then within watercourses, leaky dams, um, sedimentation ponds to try and keep soil out of uh, from from running down the catchment um, and also uh, clean water ponds uh, as well um, as that actually increases the overall biodiversity within the catchment so really just improving water quality um, but also very much about keeping soils uh, in in fields. Uh, these are some model data from that experiment, um, and it goes back to the, the reduced tillage um, discussion um, and clearly shows that uh, the, the less that you actually do in your fields, uh, the more of the soil that you keep in, in the field. But I think for me, what, uh, what really stood out was that actually a good buffer along the watercourse uh, can uh, uh, prevent anything from, from getting in, into the watercourse. So, you know, even, even if you aren't ready to make the step for, of reduced tillage, which it doesn't work in your farming system, then, you know, you can still do something to, to keep soils in the field. And, uh, you know, over the last two years, we've had some serious extreme weather events um, and I think a lot of farmers are really focusing their mind on, on how to, to manage soils better and to, to keep, keep the soil in the field. So, um, 
just really to summarize um, simple steps to, to sustainable, making sustainable farming pay. Um, step one, I think tillage options are, are flexible. Uh, I think it is quite daunting for farmers that have been following conventional farming systems uh, for many years to, to actually think about reduced tillage. Uh, I, I know we have uh, really had problems and you know struggled with some some of the the concepts and, and bits of machinery on on heavy soil um, but I think you know the, the system can be flexible and it's best to make a first step towards reducing tillage than than not to go there at all so uh, you probably can make a system work for you if if you have a go at it and maybe it's safer to talk about regenerative approaches rather than going down the whole regenerative farming uh, sort of system. Step two, design agri-environment schemes to deliver benefits for you. Think about integrated pest management, think about carbon sequestration, think about building natural capital on your farm. Uh, this is exactly what we do at the Allerton Trust. Every, every stewardship option has got a kind of dual purpose. It does a few things and it brings in benefits, different benefits, um, uh, as well as, as the payment. And then lastly, protect your water and keep the soil in your field because that's where it's most used to you. Okay, thanks very much. Great, thank you, Sarah. And it's so lovely to sort of see the evidence and research that goes into all of this thinking and what you, you, know, what you do to build up these business plans that are imperative, obviously, for the future of the farm. So. So thank you for that. Um, so next we're gonna go into um, the Slido. So this is the question from Richard. So in the next five years, what new revenue streams will contribute most to, um, to farmer income? So in the next five years, what new revenue streams will most contribute to farmer income? So carbon, and for those, uh, so, in the chat, you'll see the, the link. And for those who want to use their mobile phone, you can hover it over, turn your camera on, hover it over the QR code up in the top left, and you should be able to answer on your phone. So in the next five years, what new revenue streams will most contribute to farmer income? Carbon, very much front and center at the moment. Natural capital, tourism, so bringing the public onto the land. Agri-environment, so very much on Henry and Sayers um, presentations about countryside stewardship, but agri-environment, maybe that means elms as well. Um, tourism, biodiversity, net gain, carbon, natural capital. Let's see, non-farm, what else is there? Direct sales. Yeah, I think the supply chain is going to be absolutely fascinating for how farmer income changes. Diversification, of course, private offsetting, um, cost control, so maybe bringing costs back under control again, cutting out some of those wasted, uh, those waste streams that are there. Um, perfect, carbon, tourism, natural capital, agri-environment, biodiversity net gain, diversification, direct sales. Great, all right. I think we'll go on to the next one. We'll go on to the next one. Okay, so next question is, this is Henry's question. So let me just send this through the chat. Okay, there's the link. And again, for those who want to use a mobile phone to get the QR code in the top left, you can do that. So, so Henry, uh, what most concerns you about building a farm business plan for the next five years? So what most concerns you about the process of building a farm business plan? Lack of information, I thought that might be there. Uncertainty, yeah. So what are the concerns that you have? Like what's in the way? What's stopping you building a really robust business plan for the next five years? Climate, yeah, the impact that the climate's gonna have. Uncertainty. It's really, yeah, elms, complexity, ignorance. So there's just a lack of knowledge as to what's coming. Nothing already in place. Good, I like the sound of that. There's price wars, interesting, whether that's reverse auction or whatever it might be. But yeah, uncertainty is really front and center. So elms, there's a lot of uncertainty about that. We obviously don't quite know about a lot of the different carbon payments. So the complexity of it all. You know, where is even the income going to come from? How can you plan for something that's not yet clear? Okay, interesting. Lack of information, lack of detail on ag transition plan. Yeah, ownership of the market. Maybe there's a question mark over, do, is there 
you know, is it going to be the commodity market or can you take more control of the market you're selling into? Succession difficulties, yeah, absolutely. Are the, the next generation ready to come into the sector? Huge question marks about that. Is it attractive enough? Poor policy by government, but yeah, really clear. A lot of uncertainty about the, uh, the complexity, a lot of uncertainty about ELMS, ignorance, just don't quite know what's coming and the climate and uncertainty as well. Perfect, okay, let's go on to the next one, I think. So this last one is Sayers. So, so Sayers question, is what is the first or next regenerative approach that you'll try? Nitrogen reduction, fantastic. Okay, so what is it from all the collective learning that we're doing together and these kind of movement towards more regenerative approach, keeping control of the farm business, moving in a progressive direction, ideally to unlock this cash agroforestry, min till, okay, more worms. Interestingly, we have an agroforestry course in Land Management 2.0, which we're going to be releasing very soon. So you're welcome to get in touch with us through the online community. Um, and we're going to be go going through that with a few people and just kind of getting some feedback as we get going. So we have an agroforestry course that's already built, ready to be um, made available to people. So do get in touch through the online community and we can have a chat about that. Um, so cover crops, min till, nitrogen redu reduction and agroforestry. Livestock grazing patterns are there, trees, um, pollinator strips, pesticide reduction, baseline data collection. Interesting. Okay, so actually starting to capture more data. Smart maps, we've got fallows and legumes, we've got integrated pest management, herbal lays, very much min till, agroforestry, cover crops, reduced tillage, nitrogen reduction. It's probably worth mentioning for those who didn't see it, um, Jake Freestone and Charlie Steer did a very, very good couple of presentations on um, farm design, smart farm design. How do you build these different components into a, a, a farm design? So that might be worth um, having a look at. It's on our website under the recording section. You'll see it there. Um, integration of livestock, so maybe mixed farming. Fantastic. OK, I think what we'll do is we'll finish there. That is all nice and clear. And again, we'll be making all of this available afterwards as well. Well, I think now is probably the time to hand back over to Richard um, for the Q&A. So, um, yeah, Rich, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Henry. Thanks, Saya. Um, I think uh, one of the questions is already Nick what I was going to be asking initially, but you know, you both covered covered the kind of future proofing businesses from, from different angles, but we recognize that farmers aren't at the beginning of this. All the farmers are going on that journey already, different farmers in different positions and those things. But from, from your personal experiences, what are those low hanging fruits? What are those easy opportunities that can be picked up in the next months and the next couple of years, as we've got this uncertainty with payments dropping and all of this uncertainty, what are the things that we want farmers to be uh, focusing on in the next couple of years? Uh, Henry, if you want to go first and then uh, say it. Yeah, so what we're seeing at the moment um, is, uh, as I already said, uh, a vast sort of increase in the number of countryside stewardship applications. And that's been driven a little bit by the fact that the EFA requirements under BPS have been relaxed. So suddenly people have got 5% fallow that they used to have, which they can easily roll into a countryside stewardship. And I'd say that's probably the, the easiest hanging fruit, as you said, Richard, there is um, going out, having a look what you've already been using for EFA, what little corners you might already have out, that bit of land that you've always sworn about that you can't get a decent crop of barley or wheat off. And they're the e really easy ends into a, into a good countryside stewardship application. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Henry. So what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I absolutely countryside stewardship. I mean, I think, you know, you've got to start looking at that if you aren't already doing it. Um, and, you know, there's so many options now that, that, that you can use, you know, sort of um, le uh, her legume fallows instead of oilseed rape and, you know, fallows as well and, and herbal lays to help clean up black grass. I mean, there's lots and lots of opportunities to, to, to kind of build it into your rotation to, to, to make it kind of deliver some benefit that... Uh, the alternative is is spending huge amounts on on agrochemicals so it's uh uh you know that that for me is is the way forward um yeah so uh now picking up one of the other questions but 
it, in the Slido, an interesting thing in terms of revenue streams was the whole idea of carbon, which, uh, depending on who you speak to, seems to be either really well understood or a total new, new area. And, you know, to me, carbon has two sides. There's carbon as a tradable commodity, and then there's carbon as a measure of, of soil health. And I wonder what your thoughts were around it in terms of, you know, this carbon. Is it an opportunity? Where do you see the opportunities? Um, where's the revenue going to be coming from this, from this, at the moment, you could probably call it a concept, depending on who you talk to. Who wants to? <laughs> I'm happy to go for it. Yeah, so yeah. I think, um, yeah, carbon is probably the most exciting market out there at the moment with biodiversity net gain and other things like that as well. Um, I think there needs to be a, a defined metric on how to measure it. I think at last count, there was 16 or 19 different metrics that people were using. So some sort of industry-wide um, metric that's readily sort of um, agreed that that's a way forward. Um, I think, yeah, it's it's going to be, dare I say it, a bigger pot than Elms, Countryside Stewardship, whatever the, the government have available it's going to be a bigger pot but it's just it's just how we tap into it um, i think people are a little bit put off at the moment by the idea of reverse auctions and these sorts of things where you can easily have a, a commodity that's worth very little at the end of a, a an end of a reversed auction so it's exciting market but it's not quite there yet i think so yeah yeah i, I mean i i have to say that i i i slightly struggle with it because i i you know we we need to as, as businesses become, you know, we've got to balance our own books really before we can start selling uh, carbon um, credits to other people. And, you know, to me, I think we've got quite a long way to go in terms of, of becoming, you know, net zero ourselves as an industry. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in the same way as biodiversity uh, net gain, um, you know, ho hopefully there will be opportunities for some uh, some farmers to to build on that. I think uh, measuring it is a, a, a real issue. Um, we're obviously heavily involved in soil organic matter uh, measurements at, at Loddington, and we, we've had very significant fluctuations from field to field, from year to year. Um, but, you know, quite interestingly, people are now talking about, uh, you know, sort of just by growing a certain type of crop or uh, implementing a certain type of management, the, the the kind of carbon build is inherent within that um, approach. So maybe that's a, a, a route that, that we'll go down. I don't know. Yeah, I must say, I've, internally, we've we've talked about carbon, but I think it's almost a, a secondary benefit to, to good management that if we're managing the land well, those sort of things will naturally come as a process of it. But moving on to kind of practicalities, and there was a question originally, I aimed at say it, but Henry, it'd be interesting to get your thoughts afterwards on it. On uh, how do we convince farmers to give up land along watercourses to introduce buffer zones? It's the kind of, it's that human side of things of, of those conversations where we're moving from an established understanding, understood way of land to maybe a, a different world. What are the sort of conversations we're going to be having? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's it's not always an easy, easy conversation to have, but I mean, you know, uh, the Lee Raps is a is, is a very good sort of starting point. Um, and over the years that I've been involved in countryside stewardship, I've definitely, you know, sort of managed to persuade people that, you know, it just makes life a lot easier uh, if you've got a six meter buffer uh, along a water course. So that's that's a starting point um, to to kind of increase the width. You know, then you then you're talking about things that, that Henry mentioned, like low yielding land, um, perhaps bringing in um, pollen and nectar that is going to provide a, a an IPM benefit. Um, so there's there's lots of different angles that you can you can take on it. Um, but but I think farmers are more aware after the two winters that we've had a very very high rainfall and actually seeing soil running off your field. Uh, and into watercourses is, you know, is quite troubling, I think, for, for a lot of farmers. Brilliant. Henry, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I've always found it a little bit of a shame that um, the standard six metre buffer strip under countryside stewardship is one of the lowest paying options. It only pays £350 a hectare and you have to start getting to your sort of 12 to 24 metres before you get any decent sort of meaty money. Um, so, again, incentivised extra payments going forward for for 
even a standard six meter margin next to a watercourse would be fantastic. Um, but it's about stacking those options. So if you put a put a nectar or a floristically enhanced grass margin, paying you your five hundred and thirty pounds per hectare, it's got that erosion benefit, but it's also got your um, biodiversity benefit. So I think it's finding and stacking those options as well for the uh, for the best site. Brilliant. A, a couple of kind of more technical questions, probably more aimed at, at Saya, in terms of translating research. You know, have you looked at translating the sort of research graphs into to more financial terms in terms of gross margin, those sort of things? I'm, I'm going to bundle a couple of them together. You talked about alternative prey um, and what did you mean by that? And then a one, another, another one about gross margins there. So, yeah, essentially looking at uh, looking at gross margins and, and alternative prey. Yeah, well, I have actually got some gross margin data, if I can share my screen again. Is that OK? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so this this is from uh, the um, Syngenta trial, um, and it just shows the the, the sort of um, margins after. So, so it's the crop income um, and then margin after uh, cultivations and then after variable and fixed costs have been taken out. So um, really the, the, it comes into its own when zero till, light till comes into its own when you actually sell the machinery and you, you no longer have those um, fixed costs. So that's, that's when it comes into its own. But um, it's not, you know, it's not a bad picture even, uh, you know, even without that. So, um, so yeah, in terms of the um, pest uh, alternative prey, um, that's really about invertebrate populations. So, so other invertebrate populations within margins and, and habitats around the farm, um, then that sort of supports the, the um, parasites and, and, and predators. So that's what you're talking about, but also floral resources are very, very important as well for uh, kind of overwintering, um, not overwintering, sort of through periods when the, the pests are not, um, not very high. Right, I'll just unshare my screen. Sorry. I mean, an interesting thing to me is also as we start looking at the range of services that, that the land is producing beyond just that food production, it, it almost there's that kind of decision around, and there's kind of a question around this as well, looking at saying, um, you know, as we focus more on, let's say, higher percentage of pollen and nectar mixes, are we inadvertently then putting in less wild bird seed mixes? And, and you know, what are the impacts of those sort of environmental, are, the, are those things that, that you're, you're thinking about, you're using to get the balance on the farms, uh, but you know, both Sarah, but also interested Harry, Henry from your side in terms of, is, is it a purely commercial thing? Or do you think of that environmental impact as well? Well, at, at, at the Arsen project where we, we've got quite a lot of different um, interests. So doing a countryside stewardship scheme is, is quite challenging. There's, there's the shoot, um, there's the farm, there's uh, various sort of farmland ecology um, people involved and there's, there's research, but you know, it's not dissimilar perhaps to, to, to a large farm as well, you know, in terms of, of different things that are important. Um, the, the wild bird seed mixes actually do flower in the spring. So they do provide floral resources. We, we haven't particularly increased our um, floral resources, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, against the wild bird seed mixes. It's just the way that it, it worked out in terms of the shoot uh, wanting habitats in certain areas, and and the pollen and nectar mixes are, are quite important for brood rearing habitat as well. So uh, they they do provide really good uh, resources, very good invertebrate populations, which is really really important for for chicks in spring and things like that. So from from a sort of conservation biodiversity point of view, um, they, they do work together, uh, definitely. Henry, what's your thoughts? Uh, I think the um, balance struck by the sort of the farm wildlife and pollinator package at the moment is fairly good. I mean, there's a bare minimum under a mid-tier. You've got to have 2% of your arable land in wild bird options and 1% in nectar. 
but if anything at the moment with the sort of the the popularity of lady and fallows going up up and up and up um we're just seeing that sort of the balance shift um and again um people putting voluntary sort of um voluntary nectar resource in the bottom of the wild bird seed mixer as well but the says um i've got a lot of um interested parties so it's not what's good for the gamekeeper isn't always uh what's good for the uh conservationist yeah I think it, if we take this forward to, to kind of future proofing, you know, that was the kind of main theme of future proofing in the business. One of the things that, that we've touched on a little bit has been climate as well. And, you know, we talk about the last two years and, and, and how bad they've been. And looking forward, you think, well, with a pragmatic hat on, we're going to have more of those sort of years coming where, you know, somebody will look and say, well, on average, the rainfall wasn't too bad. But if it all comes in one month and then we have a drought, well, we all know, you know, what is it? How, how, how do we get that resilience into that business that can handle both those peaks and the troughs? Well, <laughs> yes, if we could answer that simply, that would be uh, fantastic, wouldn't it? I mean, I think I think there's a lot of work being done. You know, that the, there's people looking at uh, drought tolerant um, varieties of, of wheat and, and barley. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of work on on um, resistance in, in crops. Um, I think people are, are really seriously thinking about, you know, that spring cropping is, you know, of more value. We're definitely having good spring cropping years compared to the past and, and not so good winter cropping. Um, and I think, you know, having a wide, wide rotation and just not putting all your eggs into, into one basket is, you know, is the way forward and, and being really aware of, of, of new varieties and, and, you know, that, that sort of research as well is, is quite important. Henry? Yeah, I mean, it's about responsible cropping. It's about having as much guaranteed income as you can onto the cash flow. Um, so not only stewardship, but seeing a lot more interest in water resources, which then opens up licensed land, um, outdoor pigs. It really it depends on your, depends greatly on what your farm's like, your soil type and all the rest of it. But um, yeah, no, it's 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 about having as many strings to your bow as possible, really. And kind of tied on that, there's a question looking at a technology, and often technology is seen as the uh, well, it'll solve a lot of things. But you know, what sort of technology would you be investing in in the next five to ten years to help decision making? Uh, well, we've been using um, SOIL in a number of situations where actually looking at. Um, gross margins on each area of every field, yields and all that sort of thing, which aids in our decision making process that we can say, well, we're, where I've discussed earlier that we're setting 200 pounds per acre gross margin, something we can see that we're at 150 for quite a chunk of the field, makes it an easy decision where we're going to put our stewardship really, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really agree with Henry. I mean, you, using those those sort of GIS tools to to really drill down and look at you know, yield and, and gross margin and things like that, really, really, really important and, and really throw, you know, so much light on the situation. Um, very useful. Um, kind of a question from me as well that, you know, we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, particularly ELMS and, and government funding, but, I, you know, in my mind, I think a lot of the farm businesses of the future are gonna rely on partnerships, whether it's linking up with your neighbors or linking up with other suppliers. That, that farm of the future, who are they going to be working with? What are the partnerships that we're going to be seeing that, that you know, in my mind, we're going to be moving away from the individual farm as an individual entity. It's about tying in with all sorts of different players around there to get that kind of balance sheet, to get that, that happening. But what are your thoughts about partnerships going forward? I personally think that collaboration is vital going forward. Um, we've still got to produce food. Uh, we haven't really mentioned that today at all, but yeah, producing food in the middle of the field is really quite important. So it would be lovely to see that the, the government actually uh, put some sort of recognition for collaboration, some sort of tradable element to Elms, whereby that we're not taking out our best food producing land, but whereby those who have less or more marginal land could take or shoulder more of the um, environmental issues and then on a collaborative scale everybody's jointly rewarded for it. So I'd, I'd love to see it, whether it'll happen or not, remains to be seen. I suppose to build on that, 
who's not at the table at the moment? You know, we often talk to government, we look at government and those sort of things, but, you know, ultimately farms are supplying to a, to a commercial market. Who's not at the table? Who's, who's sitting on the sidelines at the moment that we want to get more involved into this? That's a good question. Yeah, it is a good question. Um, I, I, from my perspective, you've got the likes of the water companies and that sort of stuff who often tie in on the water side. But then I look around and think, well, who, who else should be here? No, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I think actually more engagement from general public it would be very welcome because, you know, the, the way I see it is people just go to the supermarket and want to buy the cheapest thing they possibly can. But, you know, actually collaboration and working together and managing a, a water catchment and, and developing uh, habitat networks, you know, you're actually, you could create a really effective brand, which, uh, you know, is, is, it would be of interest to, to a supermarket or, or a consumer. Um, but, you know, you've kind of got to get consumers and the general public on, on board with that, really. And I think, uh, you know, I think that's probably something that's missing. Henry, what are your thoughts? Who's not at the table? I'm going to say, well, look at collaborative groups at the moment. They're very much voluntary basis. OK, uh, sort of an organiser might be paid for at a very minimum rate under existing environmental funding or um, general DEFRA funding. But actually, to get true collaboration, I think it does need to still be financially rewarded. Um, so I think it's it's got to come back down to DEFRA or a another body to step up and make sure that funding is available, um, sort of for the landscape scale approach. Yeah, I'm conscious of the time, and Tim's probably uh, going to get his watch there. There's a whole lot of questions, particularly around the whole. Uh, I think carbon. We could probably talk for another three hours. So uh, I'm certainly going to have a chat to Tim about having a workshop specifically focused around around that side of things. Uh, there's a lot of questions that, uh, my apologies, we haven't had a chance to get. But from my side, thanks absolutely to, to, to Henry and to say uh, you both provided some really interesting perspectives and, and thoughts on, on this whole new world. And I don't think there is a kind of individual master plan. I think every farm is going to be different and they're going to pull in different things that, that make it work for their own farm. But I, I think you've given us a lot to think about and, and really appreciate your, uh, your insights on this one. Tim. Great, thank you. Thank you, Rich, and thank you, Henry, and thank you, Sarah. I mean, I think, yeah, this is the last episode in the webinar series, and I think you guys summed it up so perfectly. Like, everything that we're going to do going forward is going to be about planning effectively as a group. Like, this is, we're all in this together. And I think, for me, what this, this webinar series has shown is that if we can work together effectively and bring everyone around the table, we can solve these big systemic problems. Like, they are problems that we need to solve as one. So, yeah, I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you for sharing your learning. Um, and I want to say to people, please feel free to get involved in our online community. That's where the conversation is going to be carrying on. So you're welcome to get in touch with people and find out more and generally engage in all the programs we have going forward. Um, on both of your points about group collaboration, we actually have a roundtable coming up uh, later in the month, chaired by um, Catherine Boyd and Ellen Brown from DEFRA, who are leading the ELMS um, working groups. And we have the facilitators on there. So we've got... Um, all the facilitators in the east of England are going to be panellists on that round table with Ellen and Catherine to really get under the skin of how do we make these farmer groups really effective for the farmers, for the natural capital market, for DEFRA and for ELM. So I just thought I'd say, um, but otherwise, guys, thank you very much for your time. That's everything from me. Um, and yeah, look forward to the ongoing conversation and see what we can make happen here. <laughs>